I recently saw a comment on YouTube that inspired the episode of this podcast. The viewer wrote, 17 days out and I'm still stuck. How have I not begun to heal? Now, this is a question I often hear from people who say they're X amount of days, months, or even years out of an abusive relationship, yet they still feel stuck, like they're not really healing. It could also happen that you feel like you've made some progress in your healing process, yet you've reached another plateau where you feel stuck again and don't know how to move past that point. In this episode, I'm going to explain the top four areas where people get stuck in the recovery in order to help you figure out where you're stuck right now. I'll give you some tips and insights, and I also want to point you towards some additional resources that will help you get unstuck from each of these four points. This is Meredith Miller, and you're listening to the Inner Integration Podcast, where you can learn the mindsets and tools to self-heal after narcissistic abuse. Are you looking for a licensed therapist to help you in the aftermath of narcissistic abuse? As you probably know, I no longer offer one-on-one coaching sessions, so I want to recommend BetterHelp, an online portal of licensed therapists providing affordable therapy to you from the comforts and privacy of your home. Now, we all know when you're in the early stages of recovery, sometimes you can't even get yourself in the shower or cleaned up enough to go out in public. Or maybe you're at a point where being at home just feels so much safer. No worries. You can chat online with your therapist or talk on the phone for sessions. When you visit betterhelp.com backslash inner integration, you'll get 10% off your first month. You'll find the link in the show notes. That link will take you to their intake questionnaire where you'll answer some questions about what you want to work on. Be sure to tick the box for abuse and trauma so they can match you with a therapist who specializes in that area. And if at any point you want to switch therapists, you can do that at no additional charge. So here are the four most common things going on when you feel stuck somewhere in your recovery after narcissistic abuse. I'm also going to let you know what you can do about each of those points to get unstuck. You can come back to this list anytime you find yourself stuck at a new point in your recovery journey. It happens. It's normal to get stuck along the way. All you need is to shift your perspective about why you're stuck there. Then put into practice the next action steps to help yourself start moving forward again. The incredible thing is there are usually some very predictable places that people tend to get stuck in the recovery, and you're never truly stuck anywhere in life unless you decide to give up. Never give up. There is always a way forward as long as you're willing to do the work. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's definitely worth it. The first place people tend to get stuck is no contact. If you're not no contact with the abuser or abusers in your life, then you're still re-exposing yourself to abuse. You're constantly being re-traumatized, so it feels like your efforts are in vain. Maybe you feel like you're doing a lot of work, but you're not getting anywhere. Maybe it feels like you're taking two steps forward and three steps back, so you keep getting set further back. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of no contact with abusers. This is the boundary that protects your healing. No contact isn't healing by itself. It simply stops you from receiving more abuse from the same abusers, which is what inevitably causes the setbacks. Now, maybe you're in a situation where you can't or won't go no contact with the abusers. Can't and won't are two different things. The only situation where you truly can't be 100% no contact is if you are co-parenting with an abuser and bound by law to a custody agreement. This is very unfortunate to be forced to have some contact with an abuser and your kids, of course, but for you, in order to exchange your kids and to work out expenses and other issues that may come up around their schooling, their health, activities, and other things. But if you're in that situation... It is what it is, so you've got to make the best of it. That means having the absolute most minimum contact possible with the abuser. It means no longer having a personal relationship 
where you discuss any personal matters whatsoever. You simply communicate like a business relationship to work out details about the kids. It's best to keep that in email or text or written form so there's a paper trail and that might be helpful in court cases. That paper trail also eliminates the gaslighting issue where they pretend a conversation didn't happen or it didn't happen the way it did or they didn't agree to something that they did. I did a podcast episode on respond versus react a month or two ago that will help you to manage the boundaries of communication with your ex with as much empowerment as possible while you guys are sharing the responsibility of raising your kids. Won't is another situation. This isn't about co-parenting. Many people say, I just can't cut off my family member, or I can't totally cut off my ex even though we don't have kids, so I'll just keep them as a friend. These situations aren't about not being able to. They're about not being willing to yet. I know, it's really, really hard to cut people out of your life, but when you're dealing with abusers, No contact is the ideal way to protect yourself. When you're dealing with abusive family members, especially a parent or someone really close to you, this process of going no contact might take time. It took me a year and a half after the point that I fully realized and accepted who my mother is until I finally set that definite boundary of no contact. During that 1.5 year process in between, I kept setting more and more boundaries with her. So... Things were getting better, but I was still getting set back, even with a few text messages each month. At that point, I was taking three steps forward and two steps back, which was a better ratio than being in completely open contact with her without boundaries, but I was still wasting a lot of emotional energy and facing a lot of unnecessary setbacks in my life. If you currently find yourself in this situation where you just aren't ready to go no contact yet with your abuser, I did a podcast episode a few months ago on, is it possible to have a relationship with a narcissist? I highly recommend you listen to that. You might have blocked the person and no longer have any direct contact with them, yet you might still be stalking their social media, doing drive-bys past their house or workplace, going places you know you might run into them. You might even be asking other people for information on them. You might be scrolling through old photos, emails, or letters. These are some ways that you're still in indirect contact with the abuser, and this will also keep you stuck and unable to move forward. Check out a podcast episode I did on no contact several months ago if you really want to set this boundary to protect yourself from more abuse. Also, if you're at this point, get a free copy of my mini ebook, The Quick Start Guide to Recovery After Narcissistic Abuse, available when you opt in with your name and email on my website, innerintegration.com. Number two, cognitive dissonance. This is the next place you could be stuck in your recovery journey. I have a couple podcast episodes that teach you about cognitive dissonance and how to get out of that mental confusion where part of you really wants to believe in the good in the abuser and another part of you realizes they're abusive and this is unacceptable for you. Your brain can't reconcile these two opposing beliefs, so it's like it creates a short circuit in your brain that redirects you back into the denial and the brain fog. This is a dangerous place to be because this is often what leads a victim to return to the abuser. If they hoover you, they reach out to you or send someone to reach out to you, and they catch you in a moment of denial, you could end up taking them back before you even realize it. It's like how an alcoholic might decide to go out for one drink, but before they know it, they're blacked out drunk and they don't remember what happened between that first drink and the blackout. Please don't underestimate the power of the primal parts of your brain that will hijack your rational thinking brain when it comes to abuse. The day after this podcast episode posts, I have a new YouTube video coming out about a specific dangerous perspective that might be keeping you stuck in the cognitive dissonance. While some people break free from the cognitive dissonance before leaving the abuser, most will work through this step after leaving. The most important step to break through the cognitive dissonance is to relentlessly face the truth about the abuse and the abuser. 
This means you're educating yourself and putting terminology or labels on abusive behavior. And every time you have memories or flashbacks, you label those with the new knowledge that you have about narcissistic abuse. This process helps your mind break free from the confusion, and that's how you'll inevitably dissolve the cognitive dissonance. It's ugly, but you've got to force yourself to face the truth so you can break free from this point and move forward, not backward. You'll also find information about facing the truth in order to break free from the cognitive dissonance in that ebook that I mentioned, The Quick Start Guide to Recovery After Narcissistic Abuse. Number three, self responsibility. This is the next place that people tend to get stuck, and this is one of the biggest hurdles that you'll face in the recovery process. This is about grabbing the reins of self responsibility. Before this point is where people discover about narcissistic abuse and learn a lot of helpful new information and terminology. They might break free from the cognitive dissonance, yet often, they don't do the important work to move forward after that point because it requires self responsibility. While the discovery of information about narcissistic abuse is incredibly relieving at first, it's not the same as healing. Without owning this important piece of self responsibility, you'll eventually find yourself stuck again and unable to move forward. I see many people confusing the discovery of important information with thinking that they're all healed now, that they know what narcissistic abuse is. You'll notice that in overcompensations, acting tough to hide deep insecurities and fears that it will happen again, or even in the way that some people seek status through being a victim or being a victim advocate. Healing and personal growth isn't as easy as understanding what narcissistic abuse is, unfortunately. It requires work. It's messy, uncomfortable, and difficult. If it were easy, everyone would do it. Self-responsibility is the first piece of inner work that you take on in order to move into stage two of the recovery journey. Stage two is the survivor stage. Stage one is the victim stage. Sadly, most people stay in the victim stage for years or even a lifetime because they don't realize the importance of self-responsibility, which is the only way out of the victim stage. Survivor is a title that's earned, not given. I often see people misusing this word when they're actually still in the victim stage. I even see some experts award the term survivor to anyone who has lived through an abusive experience. While it's true, anyone who lived through it physically survived, people who are actually survivors have taken 100% ownership of the responsibility of their lives. Survivors have empowered themselves by doing the hard work of looking within and realizing that we too need to work on personal growth so we don't repeat the same mistakes of the past. Until a person fully steps into self-responsibility, they're still a victim. It is not comfortable to recognize the things that we need to change about ourselves. It is so much easier to just focus everything on the outside, on the abuser. While the abuse was never your fault, it is your responsibility now to work on healing. Your self-healing work is what changes the internal patterns that used to tolerate abuse. This is much more than discovering information and awareness about abuse. This means actually doing the inner work to develop immunity to abuse. Information alone is not immunity because that's just the cognitive part of the brain, the primal part of the brain where your subconscious habits and patterns come from. This is the part of the brain that causes you to keep tolerating new or old abusers until you change those habits of self-care. You can know everything about narcissistic abuse. You can even be an expert in the topic, but if you are not doing the work, you will continue to be a disempowered victim. This isn't to say that survivors never meet more abusers. There are a lot of abusers in the world. That's the reality, and you're bound to run into them in various areas of your life. Some of them are very covert and hidden at first. The difference between a victim and a survivor is how you handle those encounters. Whether you continue to minimize the abuse and tolerate the abuser while people-pleasing and self-sacrificing, or 
Whether you quickly make empowered decisions to take action, to unwind yourself from that situation ASAP as soon as an abuser reveals him or herself. Now, we've all been victims and there's no shame or blame in that. However, you don't want to stay stuck there because that is a life of misery, disempowerment, frustration, and re-traumatization. I'm speaking from personal experience. I stayed stuck in the victim stage for years, getting sucked into new abusers and going back for more for my mother and other family members. I didn't cross that first threshold of self-responsibility until the end of 2015 and at the age of 37 years old. I wrote about this in my book, The Journey, a roadmap for self-healing after narcissistic abuse. Here's a brief excerpt on self-responsibility. You cross the first threshold when you take 100% self-responsibility for your life and the reins of your destiny back in your hands. At this point, you're starting to feel committed to living your truth and healing your life. How will you know that you've crossed this threshold? There is a tangible difference in the way that you'll feel when you've taken back the steering wheel of self-control. It's almost indescribable, yet you will know that something shifted. That is the feeling of self-empowerment, and this is the key to entering stage two. This might even be the first time you've ever felt empowered in your life. Before crossing this threshold, you likely felt incredibly helpless and powerless in life, or at least in one area of your life. As you cross this threshold, a new sense of self-control over your life leads to a growing sense of empowerment and upgraded self-esteem. When you take 100% self-responsibility for your life, you start to experience how your attitudes and actions affect the world around you. You realize you're not a helpless and powerless victim of life anymore. This is the point of no return. At that moment, you're crossing the threshold between the old, familiar world and that which is unknown. Essentially, you're setting out to do what you were scared to do, but you know you have to do. You may not know exactly how yet, but you now believe in your ability to figure it out. Number four, the four pillars of recovery. Once you've made that massive jump over the first threshold from the victim stage of disempowerment into the survivor stage of empowerment, now comes the deep work of radical self-care. In stage two, you'll need to focus on the four pillars of recovery after abuse. These four pillars are the key areas of your life that you'll need to work on. While there are other areas to work on as well, I call these the four pillars because they are what sustain your recovery the qualities that hold you up through the ups and downs of the process as you're working through some deep stuff. There will inevitably be ups and downs. That's normal and okay. If you find yourself stuck somewhere in this part of the recovery, it likely means you need to reevaluate yourself in each of these four areas of your life to see where the chaos is getting in and which of these areas need to be strengthened. You might have seen a YouTube video that I did a while back on this topic. I've just created a new PDF for you on the four pillars of recovery with some updated information. If you want to get that free PDF report, you'll find that link in the show notes. The four pillars are number one, self-esteem. This is about self-perception, how you see yourself. It's also about the effect that you have on the world around you. The opposite of self-esteem will show up in self-sabotage and self-destruction. Number two, Self-worth. Self-worth is about respecting and knowing your value. You define your worth with your standards and boundaries. The opposite of self-worth will show up in shame and unworthiness. Number three, self-trust. Self-trust is about knowing yourself and believing in yourself. The opposite of self-trust shows up as self-doubt and fear. Number four, self-love. Self-love is about caring and nurturing yourself. It's about prioritizing your self-care, treating yourself well, meeting your needs, and accepting yourself. The opposite of self-love is self-judgment and self-abandonment. The PDF report in the four pillars is going to help you understand what each of those pillars is about, how to recognize when one or more are lacking in your life, and it gives you some tips and insights on how to strengthen each pillar. 
Once you figure out which pillars you need to strengthen, and if you're ready to do more expanded work, on my website and in the show notes for this episode, you'll find links to powerful training sessions that will help you master these areas of your life. Ending Self-Sabotage is the course that will help you rebuild your self-esteem by recognizing your primitive defense mechanisms and learning how to upgrade them into more mature, constructive ones. Rebuilding Self-Worth is the course that will help you strengthen that pillar by identifying your values, then setting new standards and boundaries to protect them. Restoring Self-Trust is one of the most powerful trainings I've created. It will help you reconcile your relationship with your intuition and eradicate your self-doubts. Finally, self-love is restored naturally through the work of radical self-care. I have an advanced course on that topic that guides you through five areas of self-care that will help you return to self-love. That's the self-care mastery course. Keep working on strengthening these four areas of your life so you never have to hit rock bottom again. Restoring these four pillars in your life is also what helps you to develop immunity to narcissistic abuse. Because when you have self-esteem, self-worth, self-trust, and self-love, you are unfuckwithable. Remember, you can come back to this episode anytime you feel stuck to figure out at what point you're stuck and what you need to work on in order to start moving forward again. Be patient with yourself in the healing process. It takes time. It requires work and it's totally worth it because you can create an entirely different life for yourself. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Inner Integration Podcast. I hope you learned something today that helps you to see from a new perspective and to start using new tools so you can take action and transform your life after narcissistic abuse. Remember, you are enough. You matter and you got this. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, subscribe to get automatic updates on new podcast episodes as they're released. Visit us online at innerintegration.com where you get instant access to a free quick start guide to recovery after narcissistic abuse upon entering your name and email. You'll also find there digital courses that have already helped thousands of people move through the self-healing process. Get loads more free inner integration content to help you heal after narcissistic abuse on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Big hug to you.